Hi, uh, good morning to all. Today, Professor Chetan Parikh uh, will be speaking on uh, teaching the millennial generation and uh, future of learning. Uh, professor Chetan Parikh has been in academia for more than 25 years. He has been a professor at IIIT Bangalore since uh, July 2015. He teaches and does research in analog, cir elect analog electronic circuits. He has an avid interest in how to enhance student learning and how to inculcate e ethics in them. So, welcome, Professor. So this talk is in two parts and I, after a lot of thinking, I have changed the order of the, in the abstract, the millennial generation was first. So I'm doing the future of learning and then I'll do the millennial generation. And I've, I tried hard to make it organized in a kind of a logical sequence, but I, I don't think I've succeeded very much. So we may go a little bit here and there, everywhere. But that's okay. Okay, so um, the uh, focus, so this is a very broad area. There are lots of things happening in the future of learning. So today in the about one hour or so, what I'm going to focus on are these three things. So on, so future of learning, of course, there's a bigger title, right? Future of learning as it relates to online content and the how technology is enabling or modifying or revolutionizing learning. That is a broader topic. So I'm going to focus on college learning, not school learning, a college and beyond, that is one. The other is specifically video lectures and content and auxiliary content assignments tests. And I'm going to try to focus more on education in India rather than worldwide, because as I said, you kind of restrict the problem. I would really like this to be a more a discussion than a lecture and that, so the discussion in discussion is in blue which is so all the font that is in blue is about discussing all the font that is in black i'm going to blabber and lecture so. uh, a little bit of my background because this relates to uh, things i would talk about so i have been a faculty at IIT Bombay for six years, at Purdue for 1.5 years, at DIA City in Gandhinagar for seven and a half years, at Ahmedabad University, which is in Ahmedabad, for three years, and at IIIT Bangalore for four years. So please ask questions, you know, as I said, we'll have a discussion, but please don't ask me why I've moved to over so many jobs, that we'll have a separate, uh, I'll answer that separately. Uh, okay, so the contents of this talk are, College learning current, although the title says future, let's start with the current and go to the future. And the second part is teaching the millennial, millennial generation. College learning today. Let's think about the average MTech in CS student at IIIT Bangalore, right here at home. The average, average IIIT Bangalore CS MTech student. What does his stay here look like? And here is a brief description, especially the ac academic part of it, not talking about non-academic part. So he'll sit in classes of 100 to 150. Most of his classes will be 100 to 150. He will not have personal interactions with most of his teachers. Teachers, most teachers will not know him by name or by face or would have made eye contact with him or her. I said him, her is implied. <laughs> the very, uh, so, so how does his learning occur? His learning occurs through all these means, right? Uh, and lectures is one of them. One of the ways he's learn, he learns is through lectures and assignments and exams and peers and online content textbooks. And of course he studies intensely for placements and from May to August, August and gets a good job. And the professors really have nothing to do with that last bullet. It is entirely his effort and his peers' his effort. So the question I want to ask is, first question I want to ask is, what is the contribution of lectures at IIITB to the learning of the MTech CS? Student. And I'm saying CS specifically because the MTech EC classes are much smaller. So it's a different set of questions I'm addressing where the class sizes are large. Okay? 
So there is a lot of research done on this and here is just one graphic, there are many many uh, data available. So this, the learning pyramid says that of whatever we, let's say a lecture is for one hour and so much content is covered in a lecture, on an average about 5% of what is talked about in a lecture is actually learned by the students sitting in the classroom. That number may vary, I think my estimate is that it varies from 5 to about 40 percent depending on the class size, depending on how good the professor is, depending on how much attention the student pays and so on and so forth. 5 to 40, average about 20, this says uh, 20, uh, 5. Uh, other things, you know, I will not go through them. Uh, what do you think? Can I ask how many MTech CS students here? MTech CS. <laughs> All right. So we don't have I, I, we don't have a way of verifying if what I said is true. But would you what do you think about this? That the con the amount of learning that occurs in a lecture is about 20% on an average of what is actually taught on an average. What do you think? So I'll give you one example. So I teach a course on CMOS analog VLSI design for the first semester MTEX. And at the beginning of the semester, I give this, I apologize for saying that, but I give this really nice lecture on MOSFET physics. It's a really beautiful lecture. Uh, and uh, the lot of things that I cover in that lecture, uh, and a few months later when the students are preparing for placements, they come and ask me, sir, can you explain this charge sharing that affects the threshold voltage variation with length? It's exactly what I very nicely taught to them in August, but by May, nobody remembers it. And they cannot go back and see what I said because it's a lecture. I, my lectures are not recorded. So that knowledge that was transferred is permanently lost because it was a live lecture. And that is, to me, that's an example of what happens even with very nice lectures uh, to students. So, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, Anirudh. Uh, so the mentality of students is now like this. We don't have to take notes in lectures because there has to be online mixed drive. Uh. But rather than when we want to find that thing, we don't remember what was taught in the lecture. We have no notes there. That's the reality. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, as a result, what is a learning in the classroom? How much, what percentage of what, uh, what is taught is actually learned on an average? In your estimate, just a very 30 to 50 percent. All right, all right, okay. Anybody else? I would say it definitely varies based on first semester and first semester. Okay. First semester is 5 Okay, okay. First semester is around 50 years old. 50, you think 50? All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. So thank you, sir. Let us ask ourselves this. Correct. Let us ask that question. So this is in blue. <laughs> If actual lectures for this student are replaced, replaced by video lectures, would his learning be reduced or enhanced? As I said, whatever I taught in August is forgotten. But if it was recorded, they would go back to the lecture. Aren't video lectures better? Or is there something intangible, something inscrutable that happens in an actual classroom that you cannot capture on video? Is there something that happens? There's some spiritual connection that's made, you know, <laughs> that there's a bonding. I, I can't even say eye contact because one does not make eye contact in a large classroom. But something that happens, does it happen? Yes? Ah, nice. Okay, please tell me more. It's in blue, so. Yes? In a lecture in real time, we 
so uh, we get in real time we get doubts uh, so if so in many of the uh, lectures i have sat through i felt that the uh, if these doubts are not cleared i, w- I would i wouldn't understand okay. the next part okay so okay so the clarifying immediate clarification of doubts is one thing that happens uh, in an actual real classroom yes sir but uh, on average only 3 to 5 people ask me questions in a 90 90 minutes to right class so what does it mean <laughs> <laughs> on average only 3 or 5 students ask questions yes sujit sir i think those 3 uh, to 5 are representative of a much larger group okay who are so they are actually listening to the answers and benefiting from the an- uh, the question answer interaction this also helps uh, the other students know who to go to if they uh, get out <laughs> <laughs> okay I- I- identify yes. it might be that no matter what they want to classify them so those people they ask no matter how silly or how complicated they are Yeah. that is there also there are, there are that type also yes okay yes okay so in a face to face you saying as a student as a student he is obligated to pay attention do you agree so in a small class small class yes large so i'm specifically that's why you know i'm discussing a large class because it's a different dynamic so you know you know some of this will actually what happened in our system they had real lectures so they were just there wasn't any teacher teaching what happened was some of the students could that the teacher said that could Okay. अच्छा. Okay. अच्छा. Oh, I see. I see. So in your experience, the video lectures were not. It, it people did. They did pay less attention, and it it failed. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. and uh, i made a joke and nobody laughed yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a while to figure out that nobody was there. so so there's no kind of we'll come to we'll come back to it very important the education this learning would be reduce the impact correct 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 so you don't have a big team that access to correct uh, correct so these students belong to the village class correct correct so they can pick and choose you get the video lectures recorded on important access to my hostel room correct so i belong to the village class correct but for the same students for assuming it's from a smaller town yes yes what uh, yes. actual lecture was the video lecture would be very good. that's right we we will address that specifically yes uh, in my opinion when it comes to video lecture unless you create some very concrete deadline or reason for students to learn yeah. for learning sake is what i believe in but the reality is when you are trying to learn tennis yeah. you learn the one for which you have a test tomorrow correct. the one which you can correct. learn later on correct so there is a big question of motivation about why would one watch video lecture okay yes. so all right some kind of incentive yes like study this from this video lecture i have done it on monday correct okay. that will really see the engagement level rise like that's right and i th- I, i would say that, that i agree and i think that's true even for real uh, live lectures the attention is more if there is some assessment right following right after that lecture so okay like they want to answer 
Yeah. But uh, in visual access, uh, they will not wait, they just uh, see the answer directly. Ah, ah. Why is that? No, sir, they won't wait. The I know, I know, they don't, but why? What is the patience? Ah. Yeah. There, the, there is no uh, pressure to think, or there is no motivation to think. All right, thank you. So, it has been, and the result is 20%, sir. It looks a very kind of a simple question. Yes. I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, right. So th these are kind of real, I mean, what is happening in the world today. By students for competitive exams, this I just found out about four weeks ago. I don't know if you know. I forget the name, Ra Ra Raghavendra Rajulu. What? No. Ravindra Babu? Raula. We have about 300 MTech students on campus right now. About 80 of them prepared for GATE through Ravindra Babu Rahula's video lectures. It was an amazing revelation for me. The power, <laughs> power of video. It's, and I, I went and watched after that uh, also. It's computer science, so I didn't understand, but they are not like superb, high quality, high, uh, you know, the videos are okay, time pass. But a large number of students around the country are learning about gate preparation through online content. It's amazing. 80 out of 300. So he was going to come here. I found out because he was going to come here and students wanted to request a room and things like that. They didn't come finally, but that's how I found out. So. Yes. Okay. Yes. Anyway, Professor Walter Lewin has a very lovely set of lectures on physics. Yes. And now that is the staple for JEE physics. Okay. I see. Okay. Okay. Walter Lewin. Walter Lewin. Beautiful lectures, right? Have you watched them? Yes, sir, I have. They are brilliant lectures. I recommend to everybody. I watched one. It's like mind blowing there. So. Okay. So this is reality. Ah. Okay, so coming to what Meenakshi was saying. So when I was at DICT, I come back to it. When I was at DICT in Gandhinagar, uh, there was a student in 2005. He joined in 2004 or 5. He had done his bachelor's from LD College of Engineering in Ahmedabad. And he joined for his MTech uh, in Gandhinagar, DICT. And LD College of Engineering is the kind of one of top, the top three colleges in Gujarat where the top students go. So his name was Nishit Shah. So Nishit came to um, uh, DICT and after uh, three or four months, he came and said, Sir, it is after coming to DICT, the first time we realized in our lives that attending lectures actually can be beneficial. Because throughout his undergraduate, the teachers were so poor that they did not learn anything by attending lectures. It was only in DICT that they started realizing that professors actually know uh, their subjects. Uh, so I was at Ahmedabad University. It's a university and they had a college of commerce, HL College of Commerce, the most popular college in Ahmedabad for like generations. Their, the, today's kids, their grandfather studied in HL College of Commerce. Why do they attend HL College of Commerce? Because of their extracurricular activities. There nobody attends lectures because the lectures are useless. A large fraction of educational institutions in India are like this. This is a reality. Agreed? Yes. 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 I would say ninety percent. Ninety percent. So I don't know the number, but yes, a very large number. Yeah. So many colleges and universities in India today. They do not provide any good quality education. They conduct exams and award degrees. They provide spaces for peer learning and socialization and extracurricular activities. For these students, online content and courses provide an invaluable resource of learning. Because there is no learning they are getting in their college. The college only provides a social space a space for meeting friends, making friends, maybe learning from each other. The question of course is, are these students utilizing this vast online content to learn? As Anirudh was saying, they need motivation. Do they have the motivation to learn whatever they are supposed to be learning, whether it is engineering or commerce or arts, whatever? That is a big question. I think we as a country face, do our students want to learn? I don't know. I'm asking the question probably implies my answer, but 
So let's specifically talk about engineering because it's easier and the most content is available in engineering. Is it possible to provide an IIT quality education? NPTEL lectures are all mostly IIT faculty, top faculty in the country. We have 1400 full length courses on NPTEL in all branches of engineering available today. Can 5 to 10 lakh students be provided an IIT quality education today? In blue. Yes. In my opinion, what separates IIT and triple IIT B? Of course, the quality of education with the live lectures is without a doubt. Yes. The thing which is really the differentiator for students is peer group. Mm. If there is one guy who is doing something nice, then uh, 10 more people will think, oh, I should also do that. And then 100 more people will think, they are doing that, I should also do that. What is not at present in many, many colleges is that Peer group. 5 to 10 people start doing something great. All right. Other it's a good point. <laughs> so the learning occurs not only through lectures, but through a peer group. And the peer group is lacking except in the top colleges. What does that mean? So what is the, do you, think, do you agree that one major component of learning is a peer group who's as mot motivated or et cetera, et cetera. And that is happening only in IITs and IIIT or whatever, the top, uh, yes? No. Actually, the no. top, the top institutions, yes. Students going to the institutions, yes. Before going there, they have already prepared to go. Ah. That is correct. That is correct. But once they go there, does it help that you have a peer group who is learning and therefore you also learn with them? So okay, if I have only the, if I have all professors from IIT Bombay, all their video lectures are available online, and as opposed to I'm a student at IIT Bombay. The lectures are the same, they are available, but the fellow who is at IIT Bombay probably learns more. Partly because he is attending real life lectures or partly because of the peer group. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Huh. Again, I don't know if it's true or not. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that person was from uh, IIIT Hyderabad only, a student from that. Now, he said that uh, the, the characteristic is that uh, the general impression is that uh, among the, I'm talking the, the entry level one, is that if you join IIIT Hyderabad, you have joined a developer's community. Hmm. That's hmm. right. So, the PR group is important. Yeah. I think the perception among a lot of people is that the peer group is only present at IITs, triple IITs, and IITs, and that is anywhere. That is not the case. That is not the case. Because I have friends in PS, RB, and all. They are great institutes, but yeah. you don't hear their name being said along with IIT, NIT, triple IIT. Right. But the first thing, he's my senior, and yeah. he said learning will start at 5 p.m. in the evening, <laughs> and he continued till 2 a.m. in the morning. Achha. That's what he said. Okay. What you do from 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. is what matters. Okay. Do that well for four years and you will be set. Okay. And this is the trend within every city, whatever the top 10 colleges are in that city, okay. apart from IIT and IIT Triple IIT. How are they learning from 5 p.m. onwards? From 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. basically, the question is no longer where to learn from. Okay. That is not obvious. The question now becomes what do we learn? Because what we have to learn is only ever going to be a small subset of what is available. It's so huge now. And okay. So this kind of guidance, what to learn is where the peer group comes in. Okay. Okay. Minaksi, you were saying? Yeah, but mine is specifically in the number two. Yeah. You can literally take NPDES text six. Yeah. NPDES play. So NPDES punchline is get yeah. Lectures directly from IIT. Right. Certificates from IIT. Right. IIT. That's what they say. Right. They've already achieved the number. Hmm. No, this is courses. courses. I'm saying degrees. 
that's what I, I'm sorry, that is not well worded, but I, yeah, 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 correct, yeah, <laughs> in fact, uh, most of the scientists in ISRO, for example, are not from IITs. Right. And uh, most of the engineers who build our uh, metro uh, trains here are not from IITs. In fact, most of the IITians are uh, away in sitting in a cubicle in, uh, in Silicon Valley or something, right? And uh, yeah. so, so actually, the, uh, there is, act, uh, you know, uh, education, high quality education that's being provided that's actually solving society's problems mm -hmm. by a lot of other uh, uh, colleges, but uh, somehow they are not considered either hmm. glittery enough or glamorous enough for, uh, uh, as, uh, to be considered high quality, or they are not recognized. For that. In fact, students who go to IITs and triple IITs to pursue their M.Tech in India after writing a case are not from IITs and triple IITs. Mm, that is correct. Yes. They are all from other engineering colleges. Yes. And they are good enough to do that. Yeah. So I have a I. For for So what is it? Can you answer your question? Uh, I think it may be uh, the fundamental. Okay. Uh, so there were both that a few alternate sectors were uh they were injured in okay. their job. Okay. Um, and then uh I believe on whatever was given to me as the whether that was as good and comparable to some other kind of uh I don't know. Because today to me the success that I mean is am I doing as well as somebody who had graduated at the same time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm. That, say for example, if we really look at for the time being, we 
you take uh, let's say there are about 10,000 startups in the country. So 5,000 startups is a quality of any name and it survived for more than three years. And then you find out that how many of the founders are with college. Mm. Like for example, that top five unicorns in the country are all IIT daily graduates. Mm. So I think you should look at quality from the thing of what people do at an average level mm. rather than uh, look yeah. at something extreme. Yeah. So because uh, for the black context of this commission, the director of the IIT is here. He said, uh, I don't think those unicorns because of IIT because of the community commission. Or in spite of the IIT Delhi also. So, so okay, I, yeah, I think this can go on. Actually, my I had not anticipated a discussion on the word quality <laughs> to not the purpose of this talk. So an assumption that uh, these institutions offer quality education. So we could discuss, but let us move on because there are other uh, slides with blue font also still awaiting. Okay, so so I want to address very briefly this question of motivation. As, as Professor Rajgopalan was saying, the people who do well are the largely the outliers who are motivated. And where that motivation comes from, as you were saying, is not clear whether IIT Delhi provided, or I would think it was in spite of IIT Delhi that they have this motivation. We don't know. I, I don't want to go there. Uh, but again, if you look at the broad uh, the, la the large fraction of Indian students specifically, but I would say even worldwide, at least from what I have seen in the US and I have heard about uh, China and Korea and Japan from other people, this seems to him a, a kind of phenomenon across the, across the world that the inherent motivation to learn, the inherent motivation to learn is generally lacking in today's college student. They learn only because there is some external pressure to do, to get marks or to do get a grade or to get a job or to do well in an exam or a, an entrance exam that motivates students to study, not to, uh, not to simply learn. It is not clear if technology is addressing, if at all, the issue of motivation. The technology is creating content, but whether the technology, the online platforms and the materials, video lectures, is addressing this question. In this regard, I wanted to put a somewhat a tangential quote, but I'm putting it only because it is my favorite. So let me just read it. The disease which afflicts the society today is lack of love. Love and unity are the needs of the society. Science cannot cure the illness of the society. Science cannot create amity and fellowship in human hearts. Okay, I'll skip that last one. I don't want to get into a discussion on religion, uh, but I think the fact that science cannot create motivation is something we need to think about. Can science create motivation? Or does the whole notion of motivation or the, the energy comes from somewhere else in society, the culture that we live in? Yes, isn't exactly, exactly. And uh, that is not happening today. So the issue of motivation uh, needs to be addressed. So for example, the five to 10 lakh students who could get potentially a an education through these online uh, video lectures are not getting significantly because they don't have any motivation to get it. They don't want to learn that subject. There is not an inner desire to say, I want to learn. No, and uh, yes, yes, I'm wait, wait, I saw. So uh, that we are not, I feel, and I, I, I mean, we, if all the professors in this room student I don't know, professors are aware that this is something we question ourselves every day of our existence about how to enhance motivation among our students so that they have create this, they have this, uh, the, the, the thirst for learning that we see 
less and less with every passing year. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's right. It is. No, so we can go into the reasons and there are, we can go back to the roots. So we have to change culture somehow. We have to change society somehow. So because if I ask about in first standards, the answer I get is you learn it in higher class. Yeah. But if I ask it out again in 10th standard, yeah. I get the answer, I will learn it in 20th class. Mm. By 20th class, I no longer care about Correct. learning for learning. They can worry Correct. about getting through IIT and Correct. all. And then when I That's come to college, this is what Then you've forgotten to ask questions. When we really want you to ask questions, you're not asking anymore because you've been preconditioned. Yeah. Okay. But unfortunately, this is not uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's right. So, in fact, so I attended this Future of Learning conference last year in I I am Bangalore, 2018, and one speaker asked one question, and I I really liked that question. He said, "Can we make learning as habit forming as smoking?" I really liked that. You know, can I make? It's like I have to smoke. Can we make learning like that? Then our life will be made. I'm not talking to professors. Beautiful. Yeah. But we don't know how to do it. So. Okay. Uh, future. I don't know that our issue is behind. Sorry? All effective learning yes. takes place when you set up a social context. Yes. I think I'm loud enough. No. No? no. Okay. <laughs> When you set up a social context, that is what gives yes. motivation. Yes. You have to have a class, yes. and the class has to have an identity. Each member of the class has to have an identity through the class. I'm a member of this class. And then there is peer group interaction, clarification of doubts, trying to prove that. And then there are challenging things that the teacher does. So these are all principles which are very, very important in the learning process. It is not that, you know, I want to solve the problems of the world. Nobody is caring, so I will go and... Yes. No, it no. doesn't work no. that way. No. It, it is deeper. It's psychological. Yes. So that's why, you know... Uh, yes. I, and, of course, there are all kinds of learning styles. Whatever holds for me may not hold for another person and so on. But uh, the social context, setting up that is... Even in online, when you set up a virtual classroom, and give it an identity and give an identity to each member, you know, through that uh, virtual yes. classroom. Things become better, yes. not otherwise. Yes, I agree, sir. Okay, so this is, given the scenario today, what can we visualize for the future? I think we've answered this question. So I'll skip this, because we, have, we didn't agree that uh, real classrooms are useless. We did not agree to that. So, given that we did yeah, not. I mean, there's set a set of context. Yes. Yeah, that's very important. Yes. Whether virtual or real. Yes. That's very important. And the sutras are, the teacher is also yes. very important. So, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, what about, uh, so let's say the, the the tier 2 and tier 3 colleges where today not much learning is occurring. Uh, the students is, the student is not getting anything or very little out of the classroom. Will they become extinct? Should they become extinct? What should happen to them? If they are not, learning is not occurring or should there be a, a drastic transformation in the way these colleges and universities function? Surya, you are nodding your head, but you are not saying anything. Say something. Yeah. No, no, sit, sit. 
so uh, i've come from a, ter- a ter- tier 3 college yeah. uh, before i came here so what i found significantly was the uh, the quality uh, in terms of how a lecture can be uh, taught so that uh, that was really a different way for me to engage uh, into the class but uh, this has been a very significant thing for me uh, in during my uh, the time when i joined engineering there were around 2 lakh people who joined along four years down the line not more than 9000 people could get a job it is in uh, andhra pradesh so that's how the statistics were i could i could even see my friends who were uh, who had done their bachelors in 2012 uh, not getting a placement and they're trying to get a job even now so that was not a normal thing in that, that was not the outlier basically it was happening with a majority around 65% of the people so i uh, i was very much interested to look how many people are going through this <clears throat> so i have dedicated myself 3 hours in a week to look through and do a research about okay what's happening around so uh, when whenever we say the quality is good uh, keeping aside what quality means uh, it happens uh, mostly when we categorize into three tiers tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 tier 1 being the national institutes central institutes uh, iits nits tier 2 being the state universities uh, deemed deemed to be universities deemed universities tier 3 being the <coughs> affiliated colleges uh, the kind of uh, social context is search it uh, is totally missing because wh- when one comes here as a student to iim tech uh, it is already said that okay iim tech iim tech students follow a minimum requisite uh, requisite to get a degree yeah. and that is totally lacking there outside right nobody has a scale to actually measure what is comparatively my degree uh, be, being like so when i see uh, <coughs> the kind of opportunities after their fourth year uh, a tier 1 institute guy can actually think of a minimum of 15 lakh package when they come out not keeping package to be the main factor but the number the amount a tier 3 guy can actually think no more than 5 lakh, 5 lakh an average so it goes from 3.6 lakh to around 8 lakhs max a tier 2 guy can think of around 12 lakhs 12 lakh and around so the average lies around 12 lakhs but one interesting thing that happens here is the number of people that are uh, in each of the tiers when it comes to tier 1 it goes around 9 to 11 percent when it goes to tier 2 it's around 20 percent tier 3 is the majority to a very very big extent so uh, is there anything that we can bring to tier 3 such that some difference can be made right necessarily you doing a degree for 4 years and a tier 1 student doing a degree the similar degree for 4 4 years and he considering considered being credible to get a job that is worth 20 lakhs a year and you hmm. considered credible only for hmm. yeah you consider it credible Make only for point so uh, the context as sir mentioned yeah. if, if we can come up with some approach that a ter- third tier and a second tier students get that get a comparative uh, space or some cultural change some some tier. cultural shift or yeah. maybe some uh, some kind of guidance from tier 1 okay for support can actually uh, okay. change okay yeah thank you i'll probably uh, not entirely agree with what you said and also not entirely agree with uh, the statements that uh, the entire tiering is a class uh, caste system that we have created and caste systems are artificial and they reflect dominance and power in society so because we don't want to be questioned as iits and triple iits uh, we create a halo around us mm-hmm. so that others don't come near us we become god and we are there to solve the problems of those who are the shudras yeah they are still languishing in the villages and the so called tier 2 tier 3 cities yeah so that's something that uh, is a dominance power related uh, structures and this uh, successful universities those who are branded successful the mits and the harvards do much better than the iits the iits do much better than triple iits maybe triple iits do better than the ps and the rvs so that's a power dominance structure learning not happening in these is again a construction of these powerful 
organizations and institutions in our societies measuring learning through pay packages and not through the impact of a different kind that jobs can create is again a construction that this kind of power domination has created so when we talk of innovation we talk of steve jobs but we never talk of uh, dr v of arvind eye hospital who may have impacted a lot more people in the world today than steve jobs so all these uh, say brandings and image constructions are are games that are being played regularly and repeatedly by organizations who want to brand themselves as the brahmins and the tier 1 institutions of the world and we need to resist those tendencies what online education does is that topic say the yes so i i agree that's uh, that's what there is an explosion of online content available but if i may add there were there are excellent books on behavioral economics available and have been for the last 50 years uh, so <laughs> so it is just that now there is online content the earlier books were there it is just that uh, people don't read books these days but okay so am i i'll go till 315 so what i what i'd like to do is this is actually just reading because i, I some of you will be familiar with uh, uh, what i'm going to read now but uh, i have i was not and i thought I, i really liked what i read so i just wanted to share this with you so we'll just read through this okay uh, because this is not much of a discussion so i'll just read through it okay so in fact what you were what i was saying is so in the last century people learned through classrooms peers and books and this is by the way a photo if you attended professor p d joseph's talk this is his daughter i brill beautiful picture i think it's an absolutely beautiful picture so she has two screens a mobile phone and a speaker which is playing music uh, so this is the today's learner and i think this is true for a lot of our students the way they study in the hostel okay so today so they have classrooms and peers but they have online resources and social networks the major issue with online resources is distractions and multitasking uh so i have written here the developers of online resources and social networks like most technologies throughout history did not think of or design for all the consequences of these technologies they developed technologies they were not thinking what will be the consequences and not all the time all the consequences are good some must be countered so here i'm going to address this distraction in the rest of this uh, ppt so this is taken from a beautiful paper that i came across last year called teaching the smartphone generation how cognitive science can improve learning in law school but i think it any any uh college so is adapted from there so laura there there is ajay here ajay sits down to study for the midterm exams opens his laptop puts his smartphone next to it he quickly checks his email while the laptop is loading the impartus video lecture a friend told him about some pictures posted on facebook that he has to see he quickly goes to facebook while the on the video the professor starts the lecture he untags himself from two pictures that are unflattering and goes back to paying attention to the lecture the professor is discussing the elements of computer security which reminds ajay that his mother's email account had been hacked a week ago he sends his mother a whatsapp message to find out about the email account the professor then seems to be discussing an important topic he switches back to listening he begins making notes but then his phone vibrates with a message from his friend saying they are going down for dinner at 8 ajay texts back then he returns to note taking what is the professor saying seems like this are becoming the norm worldwide today student enters college as a digital native 
constantly plugged in and accessing information instantaneously often multitasking it with studying or even in classrooms hopefully not in classrooms at triple itb but definitely while studying but multitasking comes with a price the habit of attending to many things has implications for the way students learn and cognitive scientists are now quantifying their negative impacts so here is a very brief description of cognitive science of human learning so this is a description of how the brain learns the brain receives stimuli in the sensory cortices from the various senses and stores them all briefly in a register at any time the brain attends to only a few stimuli this is called selective attention the brain processes stimuli to which it pays attention so we are bombarded with stimuli from all the different senses the brain pays attention to one or two of them at a time the others are in the background the information that is selectively attended to by the brain passes into the short term memory so the one we are paying attention to passes into the short term memory the short term memory can store only small amounts of information before it is either transferred to the long term memory by a process called encoding or is lost so it stays in the short term memory it has to be processed if it is processed it goes into the long term memory it is not processed it's forgotten encoding which is the process of going from short term to long term happens through practice such as learning a musical instrument memorization such as learning multiplication tables or use of schemata new information is attached or added to prior knowledge through analysis and reflection in the temporal lobe and the prefrontal cortex of the brain reflection needs time the process of going from short term to long term memory through schemata is through analysis and reflection and reflection takes time the short term memory has limited capacity and so is a bottleneck to learning long term memory is like practically infinite the key to the ability to attend to only a few stimuli from the vast array of sensory information hitting the short term memory is attention to put it simply adults learn by paying attention so when we focus on one stimulus and we reflect on it which takes time that requires attention so if you want to learn something we must pay attention so when the students study for an exam while also texting chatting with the study group about how easy or hard the exam will be or watch a game on their phone how well will they retain the material neuroscientists give the definitive answer not very well fmri tests have shown that there are two broad categories of attention top down or controlled attention is most used when we are deeply focused on a project or a goal and uses the prefrontal cortex the brain's manager so anything requiring thinking deeply focusing is top down and it uses the prefrontal cortex and it requires attention it requires time bottom up attention or stimulus driven attention is more instinctual and automatic it uses the parietal cortex the part of the brain that responds to stimuli such as email text etc is the same part that scans our environment for danger the brain is wired to attend and respond immediately to these seemingly important stimuli this i did not know each time so when an email comes we have this great desire to read it when a whatsapp message pops up we want to read it it is hard coded in our brain because for god knows what reason the brain treats whatsapp messages as something requiring immediate attention i don't know why i'm sure neuroscientists or some of you know but this is very important to recognize that it is our brain kind of fooling us into believing that something important needs to be attended to and for us to say no this is not important and not get distracted by that attention yes uh, 
Low attention has very specific Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or we believe it is. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so the main science here is to look at the relevance process. Okay. The okay. The yeah. The term attention is transitive. So if I yeah. pay attention to you, you can direct my attention. Yeah. Process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, I also, I mean, I'm not certainly not an expert in psychology, but I also have not seen. So, okay. So each time a st student respond to a distraction, they use their limited cognitive capacity, which is a short-term memory, and lose some of the focus in why, in which their prefrontal cortex was engaged. So they are thinking deeply. Suddenly, a WhatsApp message comes. Their attention is diverted. These distractions interfere with memory and the reasoning process. Many people believe that when they are multitasking, they are simultaneously doing more than one thing at a time. In fact, unless the tasks being performed are automatic and require no cognitive effect or attention, such as chewing gum while walking, most people who think they are multitasking are actually task switching, where the brain divides its attention between the tasks and attention shifts back and forth between them. This switching from one task to another activates different parts of the brain, prefrontal cortex versus the parietal cortex, so it's going back and forth. Time and efficiency are lost each time the brain shifts tasks. Accuracy can be reduced by as much as 20 to 40 percent with the greatest reductions occurring when the task which is involved intellectually demanding work like reading, reasoning and problem solving. Developing brains can become more easily habituated than adult brains to constantly switching tasks and less able to sustain attention. It becomes a vicious cycle where brains overloaded by distraction are even more subject to distraction. This is the millennial generation, the digital natives who have grown up on switching tasks and the brains are getting permanently damaged by this process and less and less prone to long-term attention and developing reasoning and problem-solving skills. It seems evident, therefore, that the habit of multitasking now so hardwired into digital natives needs to be unlearned if deep thinking, analysis and creativity are to be cultivated by them. I have no idea how to do this, but I learned from this that this is what needs to be done. The generation today does not pay attention and we have to figure out how to and because this is kind of the uh, detrimental byproduct of the technologies around us and we have to figure out how to get the students out of this. Yes. Uh, I have a keyword for the Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. I agree and I think we all have to learn how to teach it. Yes. You know, that is what our challenge is. Okay. Thank you.